Just think of it as the rough draft of the podcast world. This is the Newbie Writers Podcast with your host, Damien Boat and Catherine Bramkamp. Good morning. It's one. It's episode 174. Sorry, I think I pulled my back. I was dancing before. I always bop <laughs> around to the intro. And I, oh, anyway, see, this is a dangerous job. Catherine. It is a dangerous job. As soon as you stand up, if you just stay seated and calm, it'll be fine. Just breathe. No, I, I, I pulled my back the other day doing that. I got up slowly <laughs> really? like an old man and it went, Ugh. so I think, yeah, put me in a wheelchair and put me in a home. <laughs> You're still a little young for the home, to be homebound, so to speak. I know. I looked into it. Apparently 55 and up is when you can go into those places. Oh, gosh, forbid. I'm mean? not going to be old until I'm 80, and I have a plan. What do you mean? I've, I've got a plan. Um, I can't wait to get into a home. Okay, so what's your plan then? See, my apprentice asked me this yesterday. I don't know why he was talking to me about this. I think he was curious, probably because I'm weird. And um, <laughs> Probably. No, I've got the idea that uh, being in a home is amazing because you get sponge baths, drugs, and all the widows you can handle. Yeah. That that would be, I believe that would be the case. Um, you have to watch out though. Some of those widows are very practiced and they may hurt you while they, as they one takes one arm and the other takes the other arm. But it doesn't matter because there's trained professionals there to treat you afterwards and they give you a hot <laughs> meal. I'm not seeing anything <laughs> wrong with this. <laughs> I, think you, I think we need to do a whole blog on that. What, what, what is the... What is, the uh, exit plan when we're older, and you're ready to do it now. I'm just going to take up bad habits, perhaps smoking. I've got a whole thing going for 80. Right. I'm going to drive too fast. I'm going to run into those big barrels that they have at the e at exits to see if they really work. Mm. You know, I want to find out what's in them. I'm going to ram right into it. What are they going to do? I'm going to be 80. I'm going to look like a little old lady. I don't know. I didn't see it. I'm going to hardly wait. I'm going to drink, too. More. Drink oh, more. Oh, God. Well, let me know how that works out. I will, just stay in Australia so you're safe. <laughs> yeah, but we live in wine country too, remember? Now, That's right. That was completely irrelevant start to the show. We actually talk about writing on this podcast, and we have Terry Lu uh, Lucas on this morning. Uh, good morning, Terry. Good morning. Now, you're here to talk about poetry, something that I actually can get into. Um, none of this other writing novels business, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I could get into talking about all the widows you can handle as well. Really? Oh, excellent. That, that was a good phrase. I like that. Well, feel free to write something about it. The best <laughs> actually, actually, what I enjoyed was Catherine picking up the bad habits when she was 80. I, I had an Aunt Hazel who lived to age 94, and Catherine, your, your um, story reminded me of her saying when she was 94 to her doctor that she just discovered that eggs had high cholesterol. And so she <laughs> said, you know, if, for 94 years, 90 years, I've been eating two eggs every morning for breakfast. She said, should I stop? And her doctor said, Aunt Hazel, at age 94, you can eat whatever you want. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Definitely like that. My mom did, okay, one more old thing. My mom um, is um, almost 80, and she went in to, uh, to get some dental work, and the, uh, the dentist lays it all out and says, you, you hear your options, right? So my mom looks him right in the eye, and she says, okay, so I'm 80. I figure I've got... Now, 10 more years, so what's the ROI on this? <laughs> she said, you'd be amazed at how that stops those younger people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. But the problem is, I when I go to the dentist, he says that to me and goes, here are your options. Well, I'm, well, I'm only 32. Um, yeah, you pretty much got to go for that, dude. <laughs> I did ask him if I could have titanium teeth, and he said to me, that would be a little expensive. <laughs> ah, didn't even say no on aesthetic basis, just expensive. I Which like means that. that there's a little glimmer of hope that I could get them. <laughs> You're awful. Oh. So back, let's um, let's go back to our guest. While we, I, I just we went off on tangents. I just came back from. I, I was gone last week, so thank you, Damien, for taking over. That's awesome. And um, I'm, I'm back and energized. And um, Terry, you are a very well-published poet, and you're also a poet coach, a poetry coach, and that caught my eye, which is why I wanted to talk with you today. So tell us, a, tell us a little bit about your journey from A 
to be poetry, you know, from okay. wherever you were to being a poet, a poet and, and being you know, part of that literary, literary piece of the world? Well, I came to writing uh, poetry very late. Um, when I was 20 years old, I took a class at New Mexico State University um, under a poet by the name of Keith Wilson. Um, and he brought William Stafford to our campus to read. And I'd never heard um, anyone read and use language the way he did. And it basically turned my world upside down. Um, unfortunately, my parents would not allow me to change my major because they were, they were footing the bill for, for college and, and I was getting scholarships. And they said, hey, you know, if you change your major, uh, who's going to pay for that? And so they made a good point. Um, so I stayed on my track. I, I grew up in a very fundamental religious home. I was a child preacher. Uh, at age 11, I was standing, you know, on a little orange box behind pulpits in New Mexico preaching sermons. Wow. Um, so as I grew older, uh, it was just assumed that I would go into the ministry, which, which I did. Uh, graduated from seminary. Um, after three years of being on church staff and basically being the most liberal person, you know, in the Southern Baptist Convention that I could find, um, <laughs> I, left the, I left the ministry. Um, and I went back into retail, which had uh, served me through two degrees. Okay. And I basically was a retail executive for, for the past 30 years. But about 15 years ago, um, I ran up against a brick wall in my life, and um, I started communicating with Keith Wilson again. Uh, we, had, we had had sort of an um, on and off uh, communication over my life about poetry and we'd exchange poems but I had not really written anything seriously and I started a practice about 15 years ago of getting up like William Stafford did every morning and writing and I sent uh, I sent work to Keith and he said listen um, he said this work is certainly worthy of me it's it's worthy of, uh, of William Stafford who got you writing he said you should send your work out so I started sending my work out to the little magazines, as he called them. Mm -hmm. um, but I made a major decision, and that was I started stepping down from positions of high responsibility in my job to positions oh. of lesser responsibility so I could actually have time to write. And um, in 2006, I went back to graduate school, started my poetry MFA at Columbia College Chicago. In fact, I was working for a company that the CEO was so kind to allow me to actually get out of store operations and get into a subsidiary company that was based in Chicago so I could actually start working on my MFA. Um, but how and does I that, worked how does nice. that work? Like, yeah. How did, yeah. How did your boss react? Like, were, you, were you building up to the conversation where you said, look, I need to talk to you for a minute. So, yeah, sure, what's going on? <laughs> like, well, you know how I have a lot of responsibility here. <laughs> I actually would like to have minimal responsibility. <laughs> less. Yeah. And, and he says, okay, you're doing really well in the position, though. Why do you want less responsibility? Um, I want to write poetry. <laughs> like, how did that conversation yes. go down? Did the look on his face go, okay? <laughs> Interesting you should ask. My... My immediate supervisor was a PhD clinical psychologist, and you know when he hired me, he knew that what I enjoyed doing more than anything was teaching, even in my profession of retail. And he knew of my interest in, in poetry, my interest in writing and reading. And it wasn't a big surprise to him, but what, what it got to be was a, a rather funny joke, because every time I walked in his office, he, he managed me very loosely. He was, he was the president of the company. And every time I walked into his office, he said, oh, no, you want to step down again. You know? <laughs> so I literally went from, you know, vice president of, of store operations to senior regional manager to regional manager to district manager to store manager. And, you know, um, for the past three years, I've been a part-time salesperson in one store until two months ago. I turned my resignation in and I am no longer working in retail. I'm basically writing full time, editing full time, and helping other people write the best poetry they can full time. How does that go with the other employees that are like at the real sort of bottom, trying to work their way up? And you come in, you're <laughs> like, "Oh, I'm here to work with you." And they're like, "Oh, 
That guy's from you know, upper management. Be careful. He's, he's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, I could not have worked for for everyone in the company, you know. I actually ended up working in the store for a manager who I hired um, a dozen years prior. Hmm. Um, and we were good friends, and so it was an easy transition for me to work with him. Um, but it wouldn't have worked, you know, with most people. Hmm. I think from top down, it's such a good idea. It's like, well, yeah, sure, you can sort of work anywhere. If you're <laughs> sure. up the top here, you can go down the bottom if you like. That's not a problem. <laughs> exactly. You know, we're happy with you there. But from the bottom looking up, it'd be like, right, is this undercover boss? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm trying to think out how I would react if one of my guys came to me and said, mm, you know what? I think I might just go there. I think I'd be fine with it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think you have to be. Yeah. Really. I mean, that yeah. would just be bad because it's it's often better to get something out of someone rather than annoying them so they just leave, I think. Right, right. Or underperforming in a highly placed position. Right. Yeah, you know, where you're distracted and not not able to do the you know do that high level work because your your you know, your heart and your mind is someplace else. Mm. Sure. But it does explain who keeps writing the limericks on the toilet door. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to come out somewhere. Yeah, that's right. So <laughs> that's true. When it comes to the poetry, do you remember one of the first things you wrote down, and then have you looked back at that years later and thought, "My word, why did I even bother?" Um, yes, I do, as a matter of fact, um, because, you know, for, for decades I, I wrote crap, you know, um, clunkers all the time, um, except I'm a, I, I believe in revision so much that, you know, I was thinking about what sort of things you might ask me, and um, I remembered that I had published three years ago a poem that um, I actually started in Keith Wilson's class in 1970, and I actually worked on the poem for 42 years before it got published. Um, How long is it? And uh, it's probably it's probably 20 lines long, you know, 20, 24 lines long. Um, hmm. But it's um, that you know, revision is something that I that I really really believe in, and uh, I stuck with it, and um, that's the way my whole writing has been. I I. I'm not very prolific, you know. I've been writing for 15 years. I have um, I have a couple of chat books, and my first uh, my first full length book is coming out next year. But I don't have um, I don't have this huge body of work that this 15 years represents. Yeah, but but that, I, um, that doesn't really matter. I mean, we we, no. have, we have guests on and say, well, I just finally finished my first book after 10 years. Sure. Yeah. So they've literally got nothing to show for right. that prior. So, right. You know. Well, you have something to show for it, but you're just not going to show it to anybody else. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah, this exactly. is true. Exactly. I think that's an interesting that's an interesting point because I'm, on on two levels, I had um, I was talking to somebody. I, I every April for Poetry Month, I I just I write a poem a day and write really wonderful crappy poems, and then spend them and then spend about six months revising them, and then when they get good enough, I send them out. And somebody said I was talking to somebody about that, and they said. Oh, do you, do you, you re? She she couldn't understand the revision, correction, rewriting of the poem. I think sometimes people think that the poems just emerge, ta-da, <laughs> and, and don't realize how seriously worked over these pieces are. Right, right. I I talk to uh, people that I work with that I coach about placeholder words and placeholder lines, you know, uh -huh. because when you're in the process of writing, many times you want to push on and, and see where the poem wants to go. So you write nouns and verbs that you know are not going to stick, but they just hold a place for you. And then yeah. what you have to do is come back and uh, look at those and make sure that they're strong enough, and most of the time they're not, and, um, and find stronger nouns, stronger verbs, uh, that make music, um, you know, that have a metaphorical sense to the poem rather than than overstating or understating, you know, what you're trying to do. So Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. So if you're coaching someone or they've, you know, sent you some stuff, what's the most ridiculous comment that they've ever had to you? Something like, but 
it doesn't rhyme. <laughs> you mean the comment they've had to me about my comment? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I don't know if it's the most ridiculous. It's it's sort of the one that is very common, and that is um, when a word or a phrase is challenged, I'll hear many times, but that's not the way it happened. Okay. Ah. Uh, meaning that they're writing, you know, autobiographically. Right. And so the word that they've chosen is exactly the word in their mind that that happened to them or the phrase that happened to them. And I love Dorian Locke's answer to that. Uh, she says, uh, we love you, but we really don't care. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because <laughs> it's, it's about the work. It's not about your chronicling you know, uh, your experience or expressing your opinion, uh, ultimately it's about the, the finished product. It's about the, the piece of art that you're creating. And your readers really don't care if it didn't happen exactly that way yes. or, you know, sure. it, it was a spoon instead of a fork. They really don't care. But then they don't really know either. Right. Like if I'm reading a piece and I see that you know, they held a spoon, I'm not going to think... Ooh, it doesn't have a spoon vibe to it. <laughs> it, it you know, if you look at it for the overall thing, I don't know. Do you find that that's um, part of the challenge when people are, because you're, you're, you're coaching, you know, poets, um, do you find that that's part of the challenge where they, they become very wrapped up in, quote, how it happened? You know, and I, I, you know, I get this coaching fiction writers as well, and... What do you, how do you manage that when you need to tell them it's not really about what happens, it's about kind of the es essential truth about what happens, and those are different things. How do you approach that for your clients? Well, some of the language that I use is that um, when we talk about truth is that it doesn't have to be historical truth in order for it to be emotional truth. Oh, and, that's good. Uh, yeah, and what people, I think, most readers are interested in is emotional truth. Does it ring true with their experience, with uh, you know, the experience of, of being a human being? Um, and if it, if it does, if it rings true, then it is true. Uh, so I kind of separate that, that history um, from emotional truth. And mm -hmm. that works sometimes and it doesn't work sometimes. You know, I have the advantage, um, you know, I, I'm not a teacher in a classroom. I don't um, I don't do workshops where people sign up and come. I have the advantage of basically deciding whether I'm going to take on someone as a client. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't extend an invitation to people if, you know, after what I do is basically I, I give an introductory offer and they send me five poems and I send them comments and then we have, you know, an hour on the telephone. Um, and that's pretty much for free. Um, at a very nominal fee, and so I can tell, you know, during that hour, if they're the kind of person that is going to, to be really uh, emotionally tied to their work, the way it comes right out, you know, in the beginning, and they're not going to be willing to do any revision. You know, you can you can see that right. pretty quickly. Oh, and yeah. so if if that's true, um, you know, I'll I'll test a little bit and push a little bit, and and. If they're willing to make some revisions, then we kind of move on. But if they're not, you know, I just tell them that I, perhaps I'm not, I'm not the right coach for them. You know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So do you think I like that? I might even, I might even take you up on your five for five. <laughs> I just have to get something decent out of the last, this, the, these last forty works that I have. <laughs> right. Well, okay. That is an interesting thing. Then, how do you work out the, the five good ones then, Catherine? How do I do it? Yeah. I go through, well, I have, obviously, I have, I think I'm working with, I did 70 for April, so I, I was pretty pleased about just, wow. again, the volume, it's a, it's volume. Then I go through and, um, you know, some of them are really bad, you know, some of them are just, they're just <laughs> bad, and you, and you know, or at least I know, you know they're bad, and those, go, okay, those are fine, they were warm-ups, so those are fine, oh, this one was good. It has. Mm -hmm. I think I look for you know something that that resonates emotionally, something that would resonate emotionally for the reader as opposed to just me. Mm -hmm. So I and I can, I can get to the you know one side and say, oh, is that working or not? And then I start I start living with it for a little bit and come back to it. Oh, this is good. This is good. And then I send it and I send it out, and that's how I get 
validated is if if somebody else agrees. <laughs> well, here's right. the thing. Do you think that um, when people go to write poetry, they try too hard to make it like poetry? Does that make sense? <laughs> like makes a lot of sense. Yeah. At some point, people are like, well, it needs to be sort of about this long. It needs to sort of flow almost like a song, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's got to rhyme, or it's got to have some sort of structure to it. You think people mm-hmm. overthink it too much, and so you end up with their some emotional thing that they're trying to write down, and it just, I don't know, it misses the mark. How do yeah. you deal with that? How do you fine tune someone to say, stop trying to write it like a poem <laughs> and just write the thing? <laughs> Well, I think a lot of times people overwrite. You know, they add phrases that they've heard from poems all their lives and uh, think that that makes for poetry, you know. Mm-hmm. Someone someone may say, put down, you know, an image, windows of a distant farm, and that's, that's, a, that's a, a valid image. And then they'll add, of my heart, you know, uh, thinking that that's going to turn it into poetic language. And uh, many times you, I will challenge uh, someone to say, look, there are bones, there's a skeleton in this poem, and let's find out what the bones are of it, and cut everything else out, and the the bones may not even make any sense syntactically, right? But start Mm -hmm. with that, and and those are valid words, uh, you know, for you to build a poem on, and the other is just, it's fluff that you've heard, you know, in poems all of your life, and you're just trying to create a poem with that your own personal poetic vocabulary. And then, of course, the other thing is you need to expand your poetic vocabulary. So I always try to find out what people are reading Mm. uh, because, um, you know, I've, for me, uh, whenever I talk about writer's block, if if I'm in a place where I'm not able to produce new work, uh, I'm probably not reading very much, you know. Uh, So I have to have some. Yeah. Yeah. Because you pull, you pull from it, you know. And I, I work a lot with because I, I teach a critical thinking class at the university level, and I we, we talk about, um, you know, appropriation and curation, and the and you know what is plagiarism, what is not, and influences. Because I I'm fascinated by that. And you're right. If you don't have the influences, then it, you know, it doesn't give this it it you don't have the same kind of depth that you would if you did extensive reading and could call out. Just I find that I just do some offhand references that it's because it's part of my language. Right. Yeah, and you need to have that language to then be more original, ironic as that sounds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I talk about uh, reading and writing as breathing in and breathing out. And if all uh-huh. you ever do is breathe out, try doing that for about two minutes and not breathe in and see what happens, you know? And it's the same way with writing. If all you do is is give the output, but nothing new is coming in, mm-hmm. um, your writing's going to get stale. Um, you know, you're going to be expressing, you know, uh, yourself uh, rather than discovering, you know, your voice. Uh-huh. Um, and um, I think you're not going to produce as good of work. So I agree with you on that. So do you have That's any wonderful. go-to? poets that you recommend to people? So if you're having that chat with them initially and you say, look, I think you need to sort of broaden your horizons a little bit and actually get out there and read some um, other poets' works, do you have a sort of like a short list that you'll say, go and check out these guys and come back to me? You know, I I do have a list. It's not real short. Um, What I try to do is listen to their work carefully and uh, determine what poets might uh, speak to their work. Um, so, for example, um, you know, I was talking with someone this past week who is a beginning writer and who hasn't read any poetry at all um, to speak of, and they were <laughs> writing in very short poems, uh, very short lines, and I said, have you ever read Emily Dickinson? And she said, no, I haven't. I said, you need to read Emily Dickinson. First of all, yeah. first of all, you know, Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson are Adam and Eve of American poetry. So how can you write, you know, mm. how can you live in America and write in the English language without reading these poets? But particularly I wanted her to read Emily Dickinson because 
of, of the kind of compactness that she was trying to do in her lines. So, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a short list on one hand of, of the people that everyone needs to read, but I try to tailor it to, you know, what kind of work they're trying to do. I don't try to force anyone into any particular uh, type of poetry, whether it's, uh, you know, formal poetry um, or uh, other kinds of poetry. I try to see what their what their poetry wants to be and direct them to the people that that can speak to that. So I have my own favorites, you know, mm -hmm. the like poet that. that probably revolutionized my writing when I was working on my MFA program was Larry Lettuce, um, because of um, just the extraordinary images he has, the length of his line. Um, I, I loved watching how his line grew from a, a shorter line as he started out to a much longer line as he as his own, you know, poetic sensibilities grew. So he he really revolutionized my own writing. And I, I think poets that I talk to many times, they have they have found a turning point in their own writing when they find that one poet that speaks to them. And kind of mm -hmm. gives them kind of gives them permission to do something that they, they they haven't done before because they didn't think it would really work or be poetic or something. And so Larry Levis kind of gave me permission to write a long line and, and not be afraid of it, you know. So can you so. can you do that? I mean, the last time I, um, I I wrote poetry a lot as a teenager. I think a lot of us do, um, and in my early teens, but um, there always seems to be a convention or this thinking. Maybe it's a misconception that everything seems to, needs to be somewhat structured. Right. So it needs to be the length. That each line is roughly about the same, mm -hmm. and you, you do have alternating lines or that sort of thing. But are there are there rules like that? Are there distinct rules that you have to follow that typecast your poem into a haiku or just in that sort of thing? Well, I mean, you can you basically you can say I'm going to write a formal poem. I'm I'm going to write a sonnet and. Uh, you know, if you're going to write a sonnet, then there are basic rules about rhyme schemes and the length, the number of lines in the poem. Mm. But um, you certainly don't have to, you know, approach poetry that way. You know, uh, Maxine Cuman, I'm sure both of you have heard of. She, I had the great fortune of being in some workshops when I was working on my MFA with her. And anytime I would get close to 14 lines, she'd say, Terry, pound it into form. Go ahead and pound it into a sonnet, you know, <laughs> because she loves sonnets so much. And, and one of the things that I discovered was sometimes by deciding on a form, it was liberating to say, okay, this poem is going to be 14 lines, and uh, it's going to end rhyme, you know, in a certain rhyme scheme. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that was liberating, but sometimes it wasn't, you know. So it it, it, I don't think there's any have to about it. Um, uh, you know, the discovery of new forms. So you, um, I think it's something that's very exciting. You know, so you must have you know a, a couple of like really favorite poems of yours. I mean, for me, you, know, you talked about the turning point before, where you know each poet would have their one poet. I guess it would be that opening of the door. For me, it was Walter right. Delamere. Um, right. He has a Poem called the listeners, which he, I can still read now. I, you know, 15 years after I first read it, and go, oh god, that gives me chills. But mm -hmm. um, do you find? Do you try and then strive to? I for a while was trying to write a poem, going, oh, if I only I could write one that would even be close to the listeners, I'd be happy. Do you try and with yours just try and write something that you compare it to your favourites and say, you know what, I think I'm nearly there. Sure. I mean, um, absolutely. I mean, there are several poems by Larry Levis spoke to me in that way. Um, you know, uh, Spencer Reese is another poet that has such a musical voice that, that I, that I love, you know, I'm, I have music in my background and, uh, for me, um, the, the thrill of poetry is the musicality of it, you know, uh, the heightened language and the, and the, the pleasant sound of, of reading it aloud. Um, so poets that do that, you know, I'm instantly drawn to. Um, the feel of the words in your mouth, you know, and, and, and the sound of them. Um, 
I think is something that draws me. So yeah, I definitely, definitely have specific mm -hmm. favorite poems. What do you think draws people to want to write poetry to begin with? Is it teenage angst? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think, you know, I think it's different. I think it's different for everyone. You know, I've spoken about Larry Levis um, a couple times. One of the interesting facts about what brought him to poetry as a teenager is, you know, he lived in the Central Valley of California, and I guess he thought he'd probably be a, a farmer, just like, you know, his father had been, and mm -hmm. stay right in the Central Valley. But um, he actually got turned on in college to Philip Levine and um, actually walked in, in in Philip Levine's office and lied to him about um, the prerequisites that he'd taken so he could take one of his upper you know division poetry classes. Mm -hmm. and, Don't they check uh, these? I tried that once at a uh, course <laughs> and they looked it up on the computer and went, no Mr. Bo. <laughs> You need to go and take differential calculus again. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier in the lit it's easier in literature to get get away with that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, he went home that night after that that interview with Philip Levine, and he said, "Okay, I'm going to write poetry tonight until I fall asleep, and if I wake up in the morning and one line that I have written I consider still a good line of poetry." I'm going to be a poet. That's what I'm going to do with my life. Oh, wow. But if I, if I wake up in the morning and I cannot find one single line that I've written that I consider a good line of poetry, then I'll be a farmer. And he woke up the next morning and he found one line in everything they'd written the night before that he felt like was a good line of poetry. So he went back to Philip Levine and said, yeah, that's what I want to do with my life. I want to be a poet. Philip mm -hmm. Levine let him in his upper division class. You know, the rest is kind of history. Because Philip Levine said of Larry Levis that he was the greatest poet of his generation, the best student he'd ever had. Wow. So I think, you know, everyone comes to poetry for a different reason, but I, I think there are some commonalities for the reason people come to poetry. Mm. We've probably, you know, many of us have probably heard the saying, what hurt you into poetry, right? Mm. And I think, mm. and I think many times it is uh, looking for something that is not present in our popular culture to really speak to us at a deep level. Um, you know, whenever, whenever there's a national crisis, um, people many times will turn to poetry or turn to music uh, and, and see the lyrics as poetry. Uh, when there's a personal crisis, many times people turn to poetry. When there's a death in a family, you know, mm. they want a poem read at, at a funeral or some kind of a service. Um, and I think because poetry is heightened language, it, it cuts through in some way and speaks, uh, you know, at a level that um, language is not used for in, in everyday discourse. And I think people are, are looking for that, um, you know, when they read poetry and, and when they write poetry. I, I, think, I think probably the, peop the things that motivate people to start writing poetry are not the things that motivate them once they really get into it if they stick with it because I think people start out wanting somehow to express themselves they want to express their feelings they want to they want to they want to tell of an experience they've had and so it's more about themselves than it is about really creating art mm -hmm. but I think many people who start writing at some point make that switch and realize that you know what it's about it's about the work it's about the poetry it's about the writing it's about mm -hmm. the language and what that language can do not just for me but for other people who read it and those I think are the true poets do you um, think there is a misconception that poetry should be that raw emotion and because you're not yeah and do you think those ones that are too upbeat initially by, well, by some people aren't taking this seriously like you're not going to see someone writing a poem about having ice cream and being on a jumping castle. No, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, you, yeah, yeah, I know. I, I think you can. <laughs> That'd be an interesting subject. And then I vomited. I be in the jumping castle would be sticky. Mm. <laughs> and then I was sick. But yeah, I don't know. It seems well, I think it's I think it's how you handle it. I th I think you know a lot of people when they start writing they 
they they write about things that that they because they have not read that much they think no one else has ever written about this you know ah, that's what it's we kind read. it's kind of like you know the first time someone falls in love as a teenager it's like no one else has ever been in love before in the entire world right, right. no one else understands how they feel and I think the writing of poetry many times is parallel to that in that you know they're they're expressing an emotion and the way they're expressing it on the page they feel like no one has ever expressed it that way before when when in fact if they read poetry they realize that it's been over expressed that way so many times yeah. that you know, it's it's nauseous so <laughs> that's what I mean when I say that many times people start writing poetry you know for one reason to express some emotion but they do it by writing about that emotion rather than using language in a way that um, elicits that emotion in the reader. That's because you know there. That's the second part of the poem. There is a reader out there, hopefully, for the poem, other than just the person who wrote it. Mm. What about mm. reading of poetry, though? I've been to a few things where they read them out, and I think, oh, just give me a fork, stab my ears <laughs> out, just come on. Poetry, you're saying poetry readings? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Is there a time and a place where certain poems? Shouldn't necessarily be read out. Do you think? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> you know, you, the one one sure way to kill an audience is to say, "Okay, I'm I'm going to read a long poem now." <laughs> yes. Ah, and they all just they all go back. I think I need coffee. I think I need to end it. <laughs> That's right. But even if you don't say that, you get a bit of a vibe when it was you know, first thing in the morning. I looked at the window. I thought, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> because you know that we're going to still be, a he's going to get through to dinner time. And <laughs> That's right. You're going to be catatonic. <laughs> You're going to be like, That's right. So, my question then is how do you, when it comes to, if you're asked to read out something, do you try and find those poems that you think, yeah, this is going to start with a bang or this is going to be short and sharp and rope them in? Yeah, and I, you know, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And you know, when you're reading, when you're reading in a in a group setting, I mean, listen, uh, one of the easiest ways to capture people is with humor. And unfortunately, so many people don't read poems that have any humor in them at all, and and one oh, <laughs> that everything has to be so serious, you know. Yeah. Uh, but people, you know, they want that comic relief, right? Yes. Uh, so I think that's important. Um, and I, know, I, I've and I do think you select your poem. You select your poems for your audience. Hmm. And uh, definitely, you know, there the, there's always one poet that, you know, goes twice over the time limit, you know. And, yeah. Uh, and it's usually the deadly one that goes over the it time is limit. Really, Why is that? Why is well, that? I, one more poem. Because, they're, you know, I'll go back to that expression. You know, poets who want to express themselves, sometimes I want to say, what you really need is therapy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You need to go and pay someone to sit and listen to you talk for an hour. That's what you need to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is where my yeah, poetry not career ended. We're not to be able to help you. <laughs> hmm. right. it's, it's true, though. Yeah. Actually, I support that because, you know, I ended up in therapy for a while and, you know, I haven't written any poetry afterwards because I don't <laughs> see the need to. That's right. You had somebody to listen to you, right? I, I, have, I, I was at, um, right. I was, I was surprised. I always try to be under when I'm, when I'm at a poetry reading. I, I don't want to be the person who went for too long, because right. I just live in fear of that myself. And so, um, I, so I just, you know, I read kind of, you know, short, snappy poems, and I, and I, and I move on. And, and the audience is, when I'm all done, the audience looks at me and they're like, "More, give us something else." It's like, really, um, um. <laughs> Yeah. I have nothing memorized. It's really interesting. I, I do the other direction, whereas there's some poets who just they'll oh you you haven't said anything in half an hour. I'll read some more. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh, I know. Tell me more about now. You are with the uh, Marin Poetry Foundation or the Marin Marin yeah, Poetry right. Center. Marin, right. po Marin Poetry Center. So tell me a little right. bit about the po a poetry center and 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 are you part of the founding of that or tell me more about that definitely not part of the founding I, I came to it very late it's been around for a long long time and um, I'm not the best person to give you the history of it but um, oh, yeah, well, but, just but I, doing now. <laughs> yeah ba basically um, Falkirk Center uh, which is an historic um, building in uh, San Rafael on 4th okay. Street has, has served as the headquarters for quite some time um, 
it, it's really a, an, an association of about 300, 350 people who are members uh -huh. who, who live in Marin, who are at all different levels in terms of their reading and writing poetry, you know. Um, <laughs> You know, Jane Hirschfield's a member. You know, oh, and she, I and, like her work. Yeah, course. and 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 we have people, you know, who are members that you know probably never have a poem published in their lives, um, and that's okay. But it's an opportunity. Um, it's an opportunity to go to readings once a month, to attend workshops, to mm -hmm. um, uh, send in work to the annual Marin Poetry Center anthology. To even read um, every summer, there's a summer traveling show that if you are a member, uh, you can sign up to have a 10-minute slot to read right. at some library or some bookstore in Marin sometime during the summer. Um, huh. So there's 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 a lot of a lot of help, a lot of camaraderie, you know, um, among the group. And I just happened to uh, about a year ago, I accepted. Um, being the editor of the newsletter, so um, it's it's fun for me because I get to um, you know be aware of everything that's going on and yeah. uh, you know and invite people to to write reviews you know and uh, and articles about some of our readings. So yeah, so do very coach, cool. Do you coach people on on how to present their work in terms of? Um, Submit it for publication. That or, and uh, also, you know, yeah. with the readings, you're saying you can do reading, a ten minute yeah. reading in a library or, or that sort of yeah. thing. If someone's never done that before, that can be quite daunting. Yeah. Absolutely, I have ne I've never actually given given anyone any coaching about how to read publicly. If someone asked me, I think I could probably, uh, you know, figure out some things to say. But um, I did um, I did serve as a Submissions manager for for a client. In fact, it was my very first client. Mm. Um, it was it was actually the person who got me into this this coaching thing. He he's a retired school teacher, uh, lives in Texas, and uh, he discovered me online through my blog. Uh -huh. um, he was interested in the poetry of Melena Morling, and I'd written about her. And then he just you know, he just emailed me and said, you know, I know this is highly presumptuous. He said, you know, if I sent you some poems. Uh, you know, and paid you. Would you uh, would you be interested in giving me some feedback? And I said yes. And you don't have to pay me because so many people have have given me assistance for over so many years that, that I feel like it's I'm kind of paying it back. So yeah, send me some poems, up to ten poems, and I'll give you my feedback. So we struck up a friendship. And um, about six months later, he said, "Listen," he said, "I am really having a serious problem uh, with with writing, and I really have writer's block." And he said, I want to hire you to help me. Uh, I have all kinds of starts to poems I don't have finished, you know, and, and I think you can help me. And I said, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to take money. Just send me the stuff. He goes, no, really, listen. He said, I've got a choice. I can go pay my psychiatrist $150 an hour, mm. and I can talk to him about writing and how frustrated I am, and he's not going to help me a bit with my writing. And he said, I... <laughs> Yeah, right? He said, but I can pay you something, and I really think you can help me with my writing. So we kind of, I said, okay. He said, you know, he made me take his money. And I said, okay, okay, I'll do it. So we figured out, you know, an amount of money. And so for the next four months, we had a weekly, a weekly uh, session, you know. And uh -huh. he said, now here's the thing. He said, I really want to get my work out there, but I do not want to be rejected. I cannot stand rejection. Oh. He said, so I said, well, you're going to get some rejection. He said, and I said, yeah, I know. I've already got that. He said, can you, can, he said, can you just handle all that for me? Can you just do it? And so I did. I actually, we worked on poems and we'd find poems that I felt like were submittable and I submitted them for him. And um, the rejection letters came to me. The rejection emails came to me, you know. Oh, so you filtered them, did you? And he would just call you and say, so how's it going? Great, you got an acceptance, and that's all he needs to hear. That's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. So in about oh, very four, interesting. about four months, he had uh, a couple poems accepted, and then we he wanted to do a chat book, and we uh, we sent a chat book out, and his chat book was actually a finalist in a national contest. Didn't get published, but it was a finalist. That's and you know that's good. all he that's all he wanted. He he just wanted some affirmation without getting you know all the rejection notices because. 
he just didn't want to go through that. And I, I can understand, you know, we've all got, listen, uh, totally you know, understand. I, I can, I can wallpaper a house with rejection letters, you know, it's just, uh, I just threw them all out. They were weighing down the house. <laughs> you know, I right. just cycled them out. It's like, we're done. I don't need to yeah. look at these anymore. I'm, I'm seeing a common trend because last week we had Robin Sullivan on. Who, it was an amazing conversation, but she pretty much did the same thing with her husband who had written, he was trying to write, trying to write, and he was being rejected. And he just said to his wife, you know what? I'm going to write a, a story for our daughter, for our family. I, I don't want it published. I don't care. I'm done with that. So he did that, and he was reading to his kids, and it was going on fine. And she said, "I think this needs to be published." And he just went, "Whatever, you, <laughs> you sort it out." And now down the track, and this is why it was a fascinating conversation. So, so he got a six-figure advance from a publisher, and I stick wow. that up for him. And wow. he, yeah, we're home sitting on the other end of the show, going, uh, "Right." <laughs> <laughs> so that's the key. This is what I'm finding out now. Everyone that wants to write books poetry, whatever, go find someone that will handle all the rubbish bits for you. I think that's what we need. <laughs> there, yeah. you go. there you or go. Or, you, you know, you could do it, let's say you don't, you know, just for, for newbies, you don't want to, or have the means to pay for somebody to do it, right. exchange mm -hmm. it. So exactly. find someone who is at a similar place, or maybe, you know, maybe not completely similar, but exchange the jobs. So I you say, yeah, so, you know, your friend, so... Poet A can send out Poet B stuff and take in the rejections and make and you know and just report back and vice versa. So that you know it's it, it's not so much the work; it's just it's your baby, and then it comes back all ravished and torn up, and you're like, oh, <laughs> you weep, and it's awful because it's sure. you know when I mean, people are especially with poetry, it's you know it's your heart, it's your lifeblood, and it's very hard to see that thing limping back across the transom. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, we we need to start a website, a bit like. Matchmaker or Tinder, but without there the, you uh, go <laughs> without the creepy one night stands, and you know you you know you're saying that, but it, it's actually a great idea. What? It's, yeah, it's, to do the exchange. It's, hmm. That's a great idea. It really, really is. Right. Well, if it's I some, get so people, it's all sort of find your find your team, and that one could be done more remotely than like joining mm -hmm. a critique group where you're where you have to physically be together to right. make it really effective. Right. Right. Yeah. But one, you know. The way I relate to that is one of the things that uh, that kept a lot of us writing after our MFA program was there were about five of us who mm -hmm. said, "Look, we're we're going to continue to exchange packets once a month." So we did that for several years, and mm -hmm. uh, actually, one good thing that happened about it is three of us uh, founded a, a poetry press because of that. We just stayed in touch, and uh, very and cool. The result, but I like I like the idea of, you know. Finding a partner and then submitting work for that partner. I really like yeah. that's that's a great spirit, uh, you know, of uh, of collaboration as well as uh, a real practical way of of getting your work out there without having to do it. So good idea. Yeah, or I would suffer through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, they can they can pay you five dollars and and you can do all that. Which there you go. Oh no, well, you see, that's it. For the, to to manage that and, mm -hmm. and and do the submissions and 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 make sure everything's all, it's more than a five dollar job and so yeah. I would never suggest that because I yeah. I would demand my rate to to do that for somebody which is fine but if you don't have the money then the exchange may work better exactly and and you know yeah. the reason there the reason uh, there's no such thing as a poetry agent is there's really no money in poetry so mm. no one is no one is really no. Going to say I'll I'll be your agent and I'll get your work out there because you I'll know, take the poet's 10%. Not, yeah, the poet's not so, going to make any money, you know. So. No. <laughs> and no one. No. And no one's going to make a movie over a poem. No. <laughs> You're not going to see Russell Crowe go. Oh, they <laughs> sent me this poem and I just had to make it into a movie. I had to make it into <laughs> a film. It was well, perfect. Well, how? I guess they did. I guess they did for how. That's about the only one I know of. They did, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, well, there you, know, there you go. So um, there seems, let me ask you one more question and then we'll move on to our other things, but there seems to be, and we, we touched on this earlier, there seems to be like a, a resurgence in poetry. I, are, are we more aware of poetry? Has it always been? Because I, I think it you know, kind of comes and goes in waves. Mm -hmm. are, we on, are we on the crest of another wave? What, do you, what is your feeling about 
where modern poetry is right now? Yeah, I think we're in a swell uh, okay. in terms of interest in reading and interest in writing poetry. And the, the swell that I see is the following. You know, I'm a baby boomer. And uh, that group of people, as we move through every stage of life, we dominate that stage because of our numbers. Um, and I tell people when they say, my gosh, how, how can you afford you know, to just write and edit and, and do poetry coaching because I know you don't make that much money doing it. And I say, well, you know, the only way I can afford it is three years ago I, I won a federally funded lifetime writing fellowship. And they go, really? wow, what's that? And I say, it's called Social Security. <laughs> okay, <gasps> because what, what that did was it had actually enabled me to say, I don't need to work full time. I can, I can do this other thing. And as more and more baby boomers are retiring, uh, they are discovering that they, can, they have the money. They, they had a good career. They have the money now to either go back to graduate school and get a, an MFA in creative writing. Unfortunately, many people think they're going to do that. And then, you know, two months after they get their MFA, they're going to get their book published. They're going to get a, a tenured teaching position in a major university. <laughs> you know, teaching, That is one of the right? MFA problems, yes. <laughs> right, right. But, but people have the money to do that, and they have the time now. And so their interests turn to the arts. They turn, they've been in business all their lives, and they're not. Hey, I believe I want to take some painting classes. Or maybe it's not an MFA. Maybe it's just they're going to go to the Marine Poetry Center. Or they're going to go somewhere else. They're going to go to, you know, one of the schools you teach in, Catherine, and they're just going to audit a class, you know, and create right. writing from you. Or they're going to go to some community college or something, and, and you know, they're going, to, they're going to feed that interest that they've had for a long time because they now have the time. They have the money, they're retired, and they're the largest group of people that's ever done that. So they're going to be reading more poetry, they're going to be buying more poetry books, they're going to be going to more poetry readings, uh, they're going to be writing more poetry. So just from a sheer uh, population standpoint, you, yeah. I think there are more people that have time to do that. Because look, poetry is a luxury, let's face it. I mean, for, yeah. 30, for 30 years of my life, you know, I had to, to work hard. I had three children, you know, and now they're... They're through school, and, you know, I can do what I do because I don't have the financial responsibilities that I had most of my life, you know. But I think, um, doesn't it change, so, though, like, it, on who is, is writing the poetry? A while ago, I can't remember, like a hundred episodes ago, we, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's weird saying that, we, I've got a, a book, a book of poems, I think it was from the 1870s, Oh, that's read, right. I remember that. Yeah. But it sort of gave a little bit of a profile at the end of each poem about who had written it, and m most of them were, you know, Sir so and so, or this person was a president of this, or prime minister mm -hmm. of that, dignitary to such and such a country, and it seemed to be full of those sorts of things. You don't really see that now. Like you wouldn't see uh, a, a publication that was Barack Obama, former president, or something. Right. Uh, it, down the road, that he's written a whole stack of poetry. It seemed to be that back right. then, that's how dignitaries and people of higher ranking would have their creative outlet. But it seems to have mm. swapped now. Would you agree with that? That it seems that more and more common folk <laughs> uh, yeah. get into poetry rather than you know, those higher echelon people. Yeah, I, I think so. I do. Um, and And perhaps... Perhaps it was the fact that um, there was a day that um, really the only educated people were people in, in high places, mm. and they were the, probably the only ones that had access to poetry books, had access to reading, and had access to, you know, cultivating that interest, you know. I mean, you know, you mentioned, Catherine mentioned the, the MFA challenge or problem, I'm not sure what you said, you know. Um, Ariel Greenberg said, uh, one of the reasons to get your poetry MFA is to find out what you're supposed to read, <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like it's a big secret, right? Who, who are the poets that are writing, you know, who are living, you know, that, that would really uh, be poets to read? And it's almost like you have to pay someone to find out, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, it's not common knowledge, is it? No, it's not. It's not. Because when you, when, you know, when, when you and I mentioned poets to 
I mean, when I mention certain poets to my friends, I mean, my friends say to me all the time, oh, Terry, you know, I can't understand modern poetry. You know, help me. You know, who should I read? You know, and I'll start naming people that have won Pulitzer Prizes in poetry. They've never heard of it. Mm. Right. 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 And so it's, not, it's not folded into their, you know, their lives. I usually, I have, I even have to, I even talk to, when I talk to students about poetry, I just say, just tell me what your favorite song is and we'll deconstruct <laughs> that because right. it, it's as good as it gets. That's how they're consuming the work. It, it's exactly. They're consuming it through music. I'm okay with that. It's not, you know, earth shattering necessarily. Um, and you know, I have a, I have moments with really tired cliches. But at the same time, if that's if they're getting it somehow, if there's something that speaks to them, I think that's legitimate. I do too. Yeah. Do you have the power, yeah. Catherine, to ban people from your class? I'm sorry. Do you have a, Do you have the power to stop people coming to your class? Like, if someone said, "Can we deconstruct a Taylor Swift song?" You just point to the door. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> never, ever come back into my class. No, 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 no. It never, it never got to that. But yeah, I had a, I had a couple of lit classes, and and I, if that was how I could get, because I was dealing with you know adult learners, people who were who had been working. I had you know at the butcher counter in the grocery store and realized when they turned 45 that they can't keep this up so they needed to move into something else and of course the education system says well you've been a butcher all your life and now you have to take a literature class in order to get retrained mm. they're like really so if that's my audience I'm going to approach it a little differently and assume that they you know they haven't read Milton and Pound and that's okay yeah there you go well Terry, it's been a pleasure having you on. We've got a few things to do. We've got Word of the Week and prompts and that sort of stuff. Sure. I'd like to throw something on you straight away and say, are you able to read a bit of uh, read a poem out to us? Uh, certainly. I'll give you a little certainly. bit of time to find one if you don't have one. Okay. Um, okay. So while you're looking for that, that'll be cool. We might do a prompt, Catherine. What do you reckon? We can do a prompt, sure. So obviously... Not obviously, but anyway, I try to stay themed. Mm. So here's our prompt for today. Do you write poetry at all? Do you write poetry? Um, try to create one now. Um, create something that's easy. It can be a poem about fruit or time management mm. or something you know. And celebrate the effort even if the words on the page look like a tremendous failure because it's the experiment that counts. It's the effort that you're going for and that's that that's the whole thing so if you look at the poem you look at the lines and say I wrote a poem that's your success right well there once was an old man of Nantucket <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'll necessarily honor that with a, a success term you don't oh. get a blue a little, you don't get a you don't get a little ribbon for that right well I'm looking up limericks now and these are, these are pathetic <laughs> There is not one filthy limerick here. Right, well, we won't do that then. Yeah, because that's not any fun if they're not dirty. No, no. Who, who writes clean limericks anyway? Now, <sighs> Don't word, know. word of the week. This comes from a word of day with Annie Garg. And this word is, oh, this has got to be American, um, gunsel. It's, sounds like a, I don't know, was it German? Gunsel. I am gunsel. <laughs> and it means... <laughs> A gun-carrying criminal. Well, there you go. Nazi. That is American. <laughs> <laughs> it is American. Or, and this is where then the second meaning is so far removed from the first one. A tramp's young intimate companion. <sighs> where to begin? That's, that was different. I looked at that and I thought... That is very different. So a gun is is a, you know kind of analog um, analog. Blah, blah, never mind. A gun is like a tramp's young intimate companion. I mean, is it is it like the the gun is a companion? I, I find that very intriguing. Yeah, but who's going to use the term gunsel? To nobody. To, but we need. That's why it's on the show. I suppose yes. But I even like the word tramp. We don't use that much anymore, do we? No, we call that the unfortunate homeless. Oh, yeah, I think of a tramp as something else. Oh yeah, you, you know. I think that's used more. That ver that term is used more. You tramp. She's tramp, such a tramp. Yeah, tramp stamp. It's a the tra <laughs> the tra phrase for a certain kind of tattoo. Yeah. Yeah, I must get mine finished. Um, anyway, 
Oh. Okay, so Terry, do you have a poem to just lift us out of the mud that we suddenly slid into? <laughs> yeah, because I'm going to bring it right down with a tortured sentence in a minute. The caravan. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do, and it's not a long poem. That's right. Because we already uh, discussed how everybody feels about. Uh, it is. It does have an epigraph. It's um, after Larry Levis. I've spoken of him, so it's a poem that borrowed uh, two lines from one of his poems. The first two lines. The title of the poem is 1967. I hear it mostly in the deep guttural tailpipes of Fords and Chevys, revving out of a Friday afternoon high school parking lot in a small New Mexican desert town, Sunset Avenue pulsing like a neck vein that leads to the heart of downtown, where Main Street pumps cars all night, stoplight to stoplight, between the A&W and the Tasty Freeze, engines overheating, then finally boiling over in ice-patched 2 a.m. driveways cooling down with the ticking sounds of shrinking metal, rebuckling of belts, rehooking of bras. I'd like to talk to those boys behind the wheels, the girls curled up on humps between bucket seats. I'd like to tell them there is nothing out here in 2016 except what they bring with them, how they should climb out and start packing, the juniper's needle leaves never pressed between pages of a Bible, the scorpion's breath exhaled through abdominal stigmata, Sand swept from sagebrush roots, lifted by the twisting fist of a dust devil, all collecting in luggage to silence. I'd like to tell them how there will always be enough falling brimstone, lakes of fire, flaming bushes, wilted flowers, how there will always be enough gods to punish them for putting their tongues to the warm clay, to turn them to salt for glancing back while walking away. How, when asked, where are you? What have you done? Who told you that you were naked? What they will need most will be to learn to love the questions. Huh. Very you've, good. Uh, you've Thank you've written you. poetry before. Yeah, a day or two. <laughs> a day or two. <laughs> That's very good. Very nice. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for asking. All right. Well, I'm going to absolutely make uh, Make a monster of the show now by playing tortured sentence. That's going to be awkward now because that was good, and this is going to be rubbish. <laughs> Next time, don't put the wrong farces on the right syllable. <laughs> tortured sentences. Don't even bother trying to deconstruct that, Terry. Now, um... <laughs> it's a welcome to the schizophrenic show. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Okay. It's the two rets part portion of the show. Now, this tortured sentence is for the world according to student bloopers. Mm hmm. From St. Uh, Richard Lederer from St. Paul's School. Where did you get this from? Did he send it to you? No, you did not send it to me. I was just I was just trolling around and I found his list. And um, he is a English history teacher, and you know, a lot of professors circulate these things around and so the you know you can't really attribute it to any fortunately to any one student which is the point you sort of want to smudge the trail mm -hmm. um, but this is um, this the uh, the groupings that I that I took these from were from actual essays written from students from the eighth grade to college and um, this one was um, from a history essay and the student writes Homer also wrote the oddity in which Penelope was the last hardship that Ulysses endured on his long journey. <laughs> yeah, it was the last, for sure. <laughs> but the hardship that he endured, I, I just, you love it. They, you know what they're saying. It's just they mauled the syntax so badly that you get these beautiful gems. So, I, you know, we'll have, we'll, we'll, do a, we'll do a few of those. I'm also posting them um, on Facebook. On our site, the uh, newbie writers page. So I'm posting um, for, uh, both prompts and the uh, tortured sentences one one a week. So check that out if you want to see more. If you like this, and I will also um, happily take in some of your own. So if you want to if you want to respond, maybe we can read your tortured sentence over the air. Well, actually, I just thought of another one, uh, but it's more you need to see it, I guess, because if you read it, it sounds okay, but. Um, Steve Davis, who's the coach, uh, the host of the Adelaide Show, the podcast here, um, uh -huh. cool guy. His his kids are in school. You know, they're learning to read too. And he noticed in one of the readers that came home from school, the the worst use of a comma that I've ever seen. 
um, <laughs> which I will post up. It is quite funny. And he, he posted it up on social media and said, thanks, South Australian Education Department. Because <laughs> this is... <laughs> Good. I can hardly wait to read it. Excellent. Mm. It's just really silly. Anyway, I can't remember the exact thing off because I don't have it in front of me, but I'll post that up as well. It's worth a look. Great. Now, Terry, where can people find you out on the internet? Um, well, my website, uh, www.terrylucas.com. Pretty easy to find. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I'm, all, I'm, I'm, I'm on all the social media sites. Great. So pretty easy to find there. Yeah. Now, is there anyone you want to give a shout out to? Wow. See? That's sound. Now, now, now you may have stumped me there. A shout out to. Wow. We do a lot of that. I, I, it's part of our favorite part of the show. Stump the guests. Really? How, how, how warm and nurturing of us. <laughs> <laughs> a shout out. That's, uh, that's, that's interesting. I, um, you can't wow. go you wrong know, with well, the spouse. Just saying. I tell you, you can't go wrong with the, the spouse. Yeah, uh, my my domestic partner, uh, yeah, Janet Goodman. She's uh, she knows my work, but she's my best critic, by the way. Uh, she's she's the most widely read person I've ever met in my life, and uh, that's that's probably why I connected with her. So I'll give her a shout out, and um, all of all of my buddies at uh, True House Press, you know, uh, Tave and and Dorinda and everybody there. So uh, I wouldn't be here I wouldn't be here without uh, the collaboration of uh, a lot of fellow poets, but I definitely wouldn't be sitting here without uh, the wonderful uh, mind-expanding, uh, emotion-expanding relationship that I have with Janet. So, yeah, shout-out to her. There we go. See, that wasn't so Excellent. hard. That wasn't so hard. No. No, <laughs> no it's not hard. Now, Catherine, shout-outs. Yeah, you weren't here last week, so you can have two shout-outs if you like. Uh, well, my first shout out is to my friend Lester Olmsted Rose, who is a nonprofit consultant and a dear friend for, since the age of five. We've been together for quite some time, and he um, he was the one who took me to New York. He was very he was mad that I had been to all sorts of uh, capitals all over the world, and I you know I was raving about Hong Kong and I was raving about Bangkok and I loved Istanbul, and it just it pissed him off that I hadn't spent any time in New York, which is his favorite city. So he he got so mad he took me. Oh. So we spent a fabulous week in New York. I got back last night and that's that's my shout out. He was amazing. It was an amazing trip. I had a wonderful time. Awesome. Well, I've got a big shout out to Jane Isaac. She's been on this show before. We love having her on. And she's got a new book coming out Monday called How Exciting. Before mm. It's Too Late. So this looks like this will be her third book, which is awesome. So you go to janeisaac.co.uk, check it out. You can pre-order it now. I really urge you to do that. She was a newbie on Newbie Writers when we had the forums and the blog. So we'll always help her out. So check it out, Jane Isaac. We'll have her, we should have her back on the show so I that she really can to, talk yeah. about it. It's because she's in the UK, so we're going to try and work out. Oh, that's oh. a problem for the time. Yeah. yeah so it sounds like, oh, either I'm going to have to get up early or she's going to have to go to bed <laughs> really late. Oh yeah, I mean that's yeah. It's a midnight show for them. <laughs> yeah, that sucks. But that's all right. We'll see what we can do. Now, who have we got on next week? We have uh, Chris Weber. Um, he runs AuthorRise.com. Um, I've been a member for a while. Mm -hmm. He asked. He was asking me about feedback so that he could he could uh, improve the program. And I looked at that for a minute. He's he's from the West Coast, and I said, well, instead of giving you feedback, why don't you come on the show and tell us what you do for authors? <laughs> And so we very kindly agreed. So we'll learn more about how authors can organize themselves and uh, get some help through AuthorRise.com. Awesome. And speaking of feedback, if anyone's doing the beta read for Catherine's book, you've got to get it back today. <laughs> it's due this weekend, yes. It is. So that I can look at it before I leave again for France. So yep. And be depressed, so that way you can go on holiday and have fun. Yeah. <sighs> All right, well... That'll do it for this week. Terry, thank you for being on. Thank you so much, Damien and Catherine. It was delightful. Oh, thank you for coming. Yes, it was wonderful. Well, until next week. We'll see you then. Until next week. Your book starts here on the Newbie Writers Podcast.